was now about the sixth hour. And there was darkness over the whole land. Until the night hour. While the sun's light failed. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Ekkor Jézus hangosan felkiáltó. Atyám, a te kezedbe teszem le az én lákemet. És azt mondva meghalt. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this is a righteous man. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home, beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man. Que não tinha concordado com o desígnio e ação dos outros, natural de Arimatea, cidade dos judeus, e que esperava o reino de Deus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. It was the day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. Y las mujeres que habían acompañado a Jesús desde Galilea siguieron a José para ver el sepulcro y donde colocaron su cuerpo. Then he returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. But when they went in, they didn't find a body of the Lord Jesus. Und als sie darüber bekommen waren, siehe, da traten zu ihnen zwei Männer mit glänzenden Kleidern. And as they were frightened, and bowed their faces to the ground. The men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee? That the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and all the rest. 把这些事告诉使徒的有抹大拉的玛利亚、约雅拿和雅各的母亲玛利亚，还有跟他们在一起的妇女。But they didn't believe the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling what had happened. Well, happy Easter, New City. And all of our friends who are joining us for this worship service, this is our first service in our new building. That is very exciting. I did think that our first service here would uh, bring more people, but we will have to wait for that. Uh, Javier is here, actually. And, uh, you know, it actually hasn't been a very warm service so far. Uh, when I came in, I tried to give Javier a handshake and a hug, and he kind of dissed me, so that might have something to do with with coronavirus, but I assure you that when we all gather together here for the first time, it will be, it'll be a great joy, and it will be very warm, and I trust we will be able to embrace each other. But I mean it when I say Happy Easter to you, and the only reason I, that I can really say Happy Easter is because the first Easter weekend was unhappy, and the only way that we can understand the significance and the reason why we can say Easter is happy for us, as if we understand what's underneath that unhappy first Easter. And so what I'd like to do in this service is walk through the passage that was just so wonderfully read to you, and I would like to see who we encounter along the way. There's some people here in this passage. I'd like to see who we meet and what they can teach us about this first unhappy Easter and why Easter is so happy for us. And so let's dive in. The first person that we encounter is Jesus in verse 46. We find Jesus on a Friday afternoon in the dark after a cataclysmic event uh, just a short distance away as the crow flies in the temple where the curtain was torn. 
and we see him to be soon a dead leader of what many hoped to be a worldwide movement. That's quite a way to start this thing we call Christianity, isn't it? There is no happy Easter for us unless we understand these events, unless we know the significance of this unhappy first Easter weekend. So we have to look at what's underneath this darkness and this curtain that was torn and what's happening here. First of all, this darkness, this tur- curtain that was torn, this, this dead leader that we find upon a cross. See, first of all, the darkness. You know, in the Bible, one of the first blessings that God miraculously provides is light that overcomes darkness. In the Bible, light and darkness is, is significant, not only physically and literally, but, but metaphorically and thematically. In fact, at the very end of the Bible, God makes it very clear that in the new kingdom where his people will dwell forever with him, the new heavens and the new earth, there will be no night. And along the way, throughout the biblical story, we find times where there is significance to light and darkness. For example, in the book of Exodus, when Egypt had a grip on God's people in slavery, God sent plagues. And one of those plagues was the plague of overwhelming darkness. You see, that darkness spoke of a curse that was coming upon the one who held God's people in slavery. And that darkness, that darkness, that that curse that was coming upon them was intended to bring his people out. You see, ultimately, the ultimate darkness in the Bible is, is hell. Hell is the place of utter darkness, utter aloneness and separation from God and 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 the pain of all that darkness might ever speak to. So darkness is a big deal in the Bible, but here, you see, there's, there's times in the Bible where there's such big events, and this is the biggest that we see here on this Friday afternoon, when there are things happening where God displays himself even in the cosmos shaking and things like darkness coming, and on this afternoon there was darkness. Why? Because it speaks of a curse. It speaks of a curse that was to come on the very Son of God. Jesus, on that day, went to the cross. And you know, Jesus went with a cover, actually, that would have protected him. A cover of his own righteous record, of his perfect obedience, of his perfect love, that he actually did everything right. He obeyed God and he obeyed the law perfectly. That was his cover. That's what allowed him to have the smile of the Father. But when he went to the cross, he took his cover off and he was exposed to the fierce darkness of God's displeasure against the guilt of sinful human beings. And Jesus took the end of that sword, of that darkness himself for all who trust in him by faith. And he did that in your place. What that also means is that Jesus gave us a new cover. You see, when the Bible talks about the blood of Christ covering our sins, what that means is Jesus gave us his cover so that we no longer have the Father's frown, but we have the Father's smile. And so our sins have been covered if we have trusted in Jesus Christ. Our sins have been covered. That's what happened on the cross. The darkness came upon Jesus so that it would never come upon us. We're covered through the work of Jesus Christ. He descended into hell on our behalf, the great Apostles' Creed says. Now, that doesn't mean that Jesus went spatially to the abode of hell, but what that means is from the very moment of Jesus' humiliation, being incarnate into this world, his suffering, his temptation, the pain, the isolation, the betrayal, all of those things to the point where upon the cross he took the Father's darkness, the wrath of the Father against sin. Jesus, it can be said, descended into hell. He took the darkness in 
our place so that the Father's disposition changed toward the Son from being pleased with him to not being pleased there upon the cross. That's dark. And his disposition toward you changed from you being the object of his wrath to being the object of his love. That's why the curtain was torn that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. It was a dramatic way in which God was saying, do you know what just happened? The way was open for people to come into my holiness to have me, to have relationship with me, to have my kingdom. It's absolutely amazing. He did this for us. That's why the darkness fell upon Christ. That's why the curtain was torn. That's why Jesus died. That's what we see as we encounter Jesus here in this passage. Well, notice what happens after that in the next verse. Then Peter, James, and John, and the rest of the 11 disciples, they start bursting out into the hymn that we know so well. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. I guess that's the first song, actually, we've sung in this place. Well, that was the song that the disciples began to sing. They were so happy. The Lord has died for us. He will be raised. He will be raised indeed. Well, actually, that's not, that's not in there. That verse isn't there. I wonder where those guys are. Where are these disciples? I don't know, but they're not here. Actually, the next person who shows up is in verse 47. It's the centurion. A centurion who's employed by the Roman government who participated in some way in the crucifixion of King Jesus. This centurion shows up, and he worships God. And he declares that Jesus is no liar. He is a righteous man. That must mean that he is who he said he was, and he praised God. This centurion was one of the first converted on this side of the cross. Well, next we find the crowds in verse 48. We're told that the crowds assembled for this spectacle. They came for entertainment. But we're told they left. They went home after seeing what had taken place, beating their breasts. In the Bible, that's always a sign of people who are broken up. If not all of them, uh, if, not, if all of them weren't repentant, certainly some of them were repentant, and they, together with the centurion, said, we were wrong. He really is who he said he was, the Son of God, the Savior, the King of the world. Then Peter, James, John, the rest of the eleven, the disciples, then they came. Then they affirmed, oh, the centurion's right. The crowds are right. We too should recognize this is the King of the world, the Savior. Let's follow him, proclaim him to the world. No, we don't have that verse either. We're still wondering, still wondering where these disciples are, the 11. Well, maybe, maybe that's them in verse 49. Here's the next group of people we come across. All his acquaintances, isn't it interesting, they're referred to as acquaintances. And the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things, watching these things. If the disciples were part of this group of acquaintances. Luke has them pictured here as in the balcony. We're not quite sure what's happening in their hearts. We'll find out later. They're watching. And because they're in the balcony watching, there seems to be no one left. It was common, it was right in those days to ensure that your friend or family member did not remain on the cross, that they would be buried and taken care of that very day. And we discover next, in verses 50 through 54, there's at least one person left, one person respectful enough, brave enough, kind enough to Jesus to come and to request his body from Pilate. Quite a brave task, actually. Do you know that Joseph of Arimathea, referred to in verses 50 through 54, he was a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee. He was actually a member of the Sanhedrin, the, the highest court of Jewish law. 
This is a Pharisee who bravely goes to Pilate and requests his body and takes Jesus and uses his own resources to carve out a new tomb, meaning there's no other bodies there, a new tomb, and a stone was rolled in front. Now, you know, this is one of those moments where I just want to point out if, if Christianity is made up, <laughs> a made-up Christianity is either nonsensical or it was told by really bad storytellers. I, I say that because... Notice here how the storyteller lets us in on who the early members of the church are. I mean, here we have already the, the first membership class, you might say, of the church on this side of the cross. And who do we have? We have a Pharisee who apparently became a follower of Jesus Christ. But this is the group that Jesus referred to as snakes and, and wolves, whitewashed tombs. Next, we have a Roman employed centurion, and then we have a criminal on death row. That's the first membership class. And one of them died, the thief on the cross, so really it's a membership class of two. Interesting way to start. Interesting story to make up if this is a made-up story. We're still wondering, where are the disciples? Where are these guys? Hmm. These guys that camped with Jesus, laid their heads on stones with him. These guys that saw his sacrifice, saw that he was a man who kept his word. These men who saw his miracles, who saw his love. Where are those guys? Do they leave the church? We don't know yet. We don't know. We do know that the women didn't leave the church. The next people we encounter here is the women. In chapter 24, beginning in verse 1, here's the women. I'd like to observe a few things about the women here. First of all, the women prepared burial spices, very common in their culture, as the flesh of the dead person would rot. It smelled, and that wasn't good for anybody, and so they prepared burial spices until it was simply the bones left, and then there would be another ceremony with the bones and a burial. But the women bring spices. They notice that the stone is rolled out from the tomb. They step into the tomb, and there's no body. And we're told they're perplexed. The women don't go and see a stone rolled away, looking in to see an empty tomb, and then do their little Easter dance and say, yeah, just like we thought. He's been raised. This is great. We were right. No. They were perplexed, just like when anyone is perplexed, you're perplexed because something happened you didn't expect to happen. They did not expect an empty tomb. It just didn't compute. Yes, Jesus had taught his disciples that this day was going to come, but they just had no categories for this. I mean, think about our coronavirus season now. If in November I stood up in church and said, guys, I mean, it just makes sense. We're hearing news about this virus and I'm just going to prepare you. We're going to go months without meeting together. So just prepare yourself now. Some of you are going to get laid off. If you're a sports fan, the Masters tournament's canceled. March Madness is canceled. I'm just telling you guys in advance. I mean, this, I mean it just makes sense. This is going to happen. You would have called me a nut. You would have called me a nut. You probably wouldn't have come back to a guy that was ranting and raving about something like that because you wouldn't have had categories. You wouldn't have had categories. If in the late 90s I warned... New York about September 11th, 2001, and warned the airline companies and all the things that, all the people who needed to be warned, we wouldn't have had categories for that. And so they didn't expect Jesus to be raised in this way. They didn't expect what happened on Easter morning. Isn't it interesting? Secondly, I'd, I'd like to observe the empty tomb did not make sense to them, and it didn't prove to them that Jesus was raised. Actually, it had to be interpreted. It had to be interpreted by two men who came, messengers from the Lord. Yes, angels, dazzling clothes, we're told. They didn't tell them anything new. They just reminded them of what Jesus had already taught. Two men came and pointed them to the word to interpret 
the events of Easter to them. You see, a made-up Christianity is nonsensical. We see, we, see that, we see that again here. You have to know that in, in their culture, I, there, there's no way that I can overemphasize how devalued women were, especially in important matters when there needed to be an important witness in a matter. I mean, it was by law that they couldn't participate as witnesses in a court of law, but even informally, they weren't trusted. It's very sad, very sad, but it was true. When you're trying to start a movement, you would never, 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 never have women be the first to be eyewitnesses of the claims of that leader. And not only were they the first eyewitnesses, they were the first ever mission-minded friends who wanted to tell their other friends about Jesus being the risen Lord. We're told that when they returned from the tomb, they went and they, they told all these things to the eleven and, and to the rest. They were telling them, don't you remember how Jesus taught us these things? It's true. It's true. We saw it. You can believe. Well, they found the eleven. Finally, we too have found the eleven. Those guys that camped with him and cried with Jesus. Finally, we find these guys because the women found them so that they could tell them about Jesus. This is not only a case of the women being the first eyewitnesses and the first mission-minded friends, but this is also the case, I think, the first case of a failed evangelistic event. They tried to tell their friends about Jesus, and their friends didn't believe. Let me remind you, this is the 11. These are the disciples who followed Jesus for years, who saw all that he did, the ones who were in the boat when he calmed the storm with a word. We could go on and on. And when the women told them these things, it seemed to them, verse 11, that this was an idle tale. An idle tale. Fiction. We're told they said, we do not believe. This is nonsense. This is the 11, those who were with Jesus, the apostles. They said, you're delirious. In fact, the Greek word for idle tale is, is uh, lirias, where we get the word delirious. That's what they're saying. These were the first ever to say on this side of the cross that Christianity is made up. Now, some of you know what it's like to become a Christian. And to be so excited about becoming a Christian and being saved. And you go home and you talk with your family and your friends and they think you're delirious. And they don't believe. And it's hurtful and it's sad because you want them to know these things. But it also makes you feel a little unsure about yourself. Maybe embarrassed. These women didn't just go home to tell their family these women went to tell the apostles, and the apostles said it's an idle tale. Now let that just sit in your mind for a little bit and think. Think about that. Again. Again. It's nonsensical to think that Christianity would ever be made up and that this would be part of the story. You know, in fact, if there's any good to come out of this, I think the good to come out of this, as I've thought a lot about this this week, is it makes the many attacks against the resurrection that have happened throughout history, and there are many, because if you can undo the resurrection, you can undo all of Christianity. And this makes all of those attacks laughable. Attacks like maybe Jesus was drugged. The disciples had a scheme, a plan to to drug him so that his vital signs didn't show until later he'd be resuscitated in the tomb. Uh, no, the disciples did not hatch a plan like that. Perhaps that Jesus' body was stolen. These guys thought this was a fictional story. They didn't believe Jesus had died. They were moving on. They were done with Christianity. There was no attempt to risk their lives to steal this body. Now, throughout history, those attacks haven't gone so well, and so... The popular attack of the day is simply to say, 
Sure, if you want to believe he was raised, go ahead. Of course he wasn't raised bodily, but spiritually, spiritually, I guess you can say that he was raised and you can believe in your Jesus. You see, again, the disciples weren't looking for any way to make up some religion to continue following the things Jesus taught. They were done. There was no attempt to ever say, well, his body is somewhere in the ground, but he was raised spiritually. No, 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 no. You see, Easter to them was a painful, unhappy burden. This first Easter weekend, for the, the disciples, it was an unhappy burden. We have to get that. We have to understand the significance of that. You see, but we also have to realize this. Because of their unhappy burden, their burden, their unhappiness is our good news. Their unhappy Easter is why we can have a happy Easter. Because they knew that Christianity was supposed to be more and they would not settle for less. They knew that Jesus had promised more, that it was supposed to be bigger and greater, and that the only way that could happen is if he were raised from the dead, but now he is dead, and they were not going to settle for less, and so they were done. You see, if it were any other religion, if Jesus were presenting any other religion, like, hey, here's some insightful and good teachings that will improve your life, it'll help you to have a better marriage, it will help you to love people well, those are all good things. But if that's what Jesus were doing, if Jesus were trying to create a following just for some other religion, then it would have been just fine for him to die. You wouldn't have had to explain it away. Every other religious leader is dead. This would be fine. It would be expected for him to die. But this was no other religion. And the disciples knew it. They knew that Jesus couldn't keep his promises unless he was alive and reigning over the world. That's why Luke 2.0, that is, a.k.a. the book of Acts, a book that's a couple of books later in the Bible after the Gospel of Luke. You see, that was part two, actually, to Luke. And this picks up history, you might say, after Easter weekend. And the history that we find in the book of Acts is perhaps the greatest historical aberration there ever has been because these same disciples who had just said it's fictional, you're delirious for believing this, it's an idle tale, we don't believe it. Those same guys go out and they are willing to die because they're persuaded that the greatest thing anyone can ever know is that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way to God. He is the only way to escape, escape our destiny to hell. He is the only way to life. And they go out preaching it. They will go out proclaiming it. They go out starting churches that will proclaim this. And they're ridiculed. They're shamed. They're beaten. All those things. And they say, this is our life. What changed in a matter of weeks from saying this is fictional to saying we will die for this? There's only one thing. They came to learn that Jesus was indeed raised from the dead. That's it. That's all that changed. They knew finally, oh, this is real. It's not an idle tale. It's truer than anything you've ever known. And it's the one thing everyone must know. You see, they never would have done this for a lie. Only because Jesus was raised. <sighs> Those are the people we encounter. What's it mean for us? Today, 21st century, here in Michigan, coronavirus season, what's it mean for us? Let me tell you a story. It's actually a story that reveals everything that's wrong with me. And normally I want people to take personal responsibility for what's wrong with them, but in this case it really is my parents' fault. You see, I'll tell you why. Because when I was growing up, sometime in the 1980s, all my friends had Nintendos. So they were just killing it with Zelda and Double Dribble and Mario and all those things. Mega Man, Metroid. I wanted a Nintendo. I asked for a Nintendo for Christmas. I remember looking at Toys R going into Toys R Us and looking at the Nintendo games and, and the, the Nintendo system and, and just longing to have that. And there was a game system wrapped 
for Christmas. And when I opened that game system, it was a Sega. The original Sega, because it was about 20 or $30 cheaper, so mom and dad, for 20 or 30 bucks, I'd be a lot more emotionally healthy today. Nevertheless, I was the only guy to have a Sega, and there were no stores anywhere nearby that I could go and buy original Sega games. And so I was stuck with the one game that came free with the system, and that is Alex Kidd in Miracle World. And I assure you that I'm the best player of Alex Kidd in, the, in Miracle World probably in our church because you've probably never played it. You see, Alex Kidd in Miracle World was a game that I played a lot, got really good at it, but there is one level I could never get past. No magazines, no internet stuff to figure it out. It just left me maddened with a part of my brain, I think, melted right around here in anger and anxiety trying to figure out how to get past this one level. And it makes my blood boil to still think about that. I finally had to go on with my life, never defeating Alex Kidd in Miracle World and saving the princess. Until a few months ago. Christmas. At my parents' house, my little nephew, Thomas, had some kind of a gaming system, and he could buy old games. I said, Sega? He said, I don't know. I said, Alex Kidd in Miracle World? He said, let me try. And we got Alex Kidd in Miracle World. And I played and I played, and all those old anxieties and fear of that level and of that poisonous octopus and all these things, it started to come back, and I tensed up until he said, you know, I have this thing where if I push certain buttons, it can rewind it. And you can go back about 15 seconds before you die. And I said, what? Rewind? Yeah. You mean I can't die? Yeah. And so I played Alex Kidd in Miracle World with a completely new mood. Now when I faced the poisonous octopus or when I faced drowning, when I faced the fire, all those things, I laughed. Because if I died, I wouldn't lose my life. It couldn't take my life. It wouldn't swallow me. I would go back about 15 seconds and then I would live and finally I conquered the game. It was absolutely amazing. Now what I want to say is this. When I learned about this life that couldn't be taken, it changed, it changed my mood when I played this little game. From one of anxiety and fear and anger, uh, constantly watching my little bank account for what I was going to buy in the shop, a shield or a sword. You see, it, it gave me a new mood. Now I could enjoy the ride. I could appreciate the, the changing scenery. I faced the same enemies, the same battles, I had the same circumstances, but a completely different mood in the way I approached this life of Alex Kidd. See, that same thing happens with the apostles when they realize the reality of the resurrection. There's a complete mood change after the resurrection because it finally made sense of all the maddening nonsense of this world. You see, before when they, were with, when they were with Jesus, Jesus talked about things that I think went in one ear and out the other, and it didn't really compute like his coming resurrection. When Jesus spoke of another kingdom that was real, where they could live, where they could store up their treasures, not on earth, but, but in heaven. I don't think it computed. It seemed nonsensical. They heard it, but they didn't really hear it. When Jesus spoke of not fearing the things that kill our body in this world, it didn't quite make sense. That they shouldn't worry about ever having enough food or clothing. They heard it, but did they really hear it? That our happiness is in God alone and not in the things of this world. Well, it seems kind of nonsensical. But now it made sense. With Jesus raised, it made sense. Now he can keep his promises. Because now they're, they're actually in union with, they're united to the one who validated his victory over this broken world and over death and opened the, 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 the door wide into this new world where there are new bodies. And lasting treasure and food and friends and the only mood is one of wonder and awe because King Jesus will make sure you are well taken care of in his paradise. That's the news of Easter. That's why it makes sense of, of the nonsensical things in, in this world. There's, there's no other news that answers those deepest questions. There is news. There's news that would change your life if you, got, if you received that news right now. 
If a billion dollars were posted to your bank account, if you received that news and if it were true, it would change your life, no doubt about it. No matter how rich or poor you are, it would change your life. News of a cure for COVID-19. Take a pill and it's over. That would change the world right now. Cure for cancer would change the world, would change your life. News of the dream house. News of the dream spouse, if you're looking to be married. All these things would change your life, but it's all temporary. The Bible teaches very clearly that no one will ever devise any kind of technology or drug that will cope with the inevitability of a world, of a life in a world where the best people you've ever known and the best circumstances you've ever had will be swallowed by death. The inevitability of bodies and minds that go bad, of death, of viruses and recessions, of bank accounts that go crazy and can never be predictable. The inevitability of, of the constant nagging question, what's life all about? Will I have enough time to fulfill my destiny, to accomplish my life purpose? Hmm, how will I be remembered? What will I leave behind? Will my life really count? There was a philosopher named Martin Heidegger who believe that anyone who's really honest with themselves can't help but to suffer from, from some kind of an anxiety disorder. He says this is the default human mood because it reflects the true perception of our condition. Just be honest and look around you and you can't help but to suffer from an anxiety disorder because, you see, we harbor infinite longings, infinite longings for joy and safety in marriage and in our homes and our families and our friendships and in our church joy and safety and all of these things are in our places of work and we want to see it throughout the world we want to see joy and safety throughout the world but there's so much wrong so much that's hurtful so much that's broken easter alone has the answer easter alone is the news that provides the answer for the eternal mood change that begins now, when you trust in this risen King Jesus, who is Savior, that's why we do church, New City. That's why we do church. We do church because we're weak and we live in a world that's constantly telling us that this news of Easter and the cross and of God's salvation through Christ is idle news. It's fictional. It's not true. It's delirious. And so we gather to worship and we gather in all these ministries that are meant to answer that lie with the truth, the truth of a Jesus who lived and died and lived again and promises us life. And so we praise him for it in worship, and all of our ministries are designed to share it with as many people as possible, from as many places as po possible, as many colors as possible, with as many different stories as possible. That's what we want to see. That's who we want to see gathered around this great news of Easter here at New City and beyond. And so this Easter week, I hope that you'll think more deeply about how unhappy the mood of that first Easter was and know that it was the only way for you to have a happy Easter and to have a happy eternity. And so I'll say it again, New City, happy Easter.